Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Silvia Schramko. I am a manager at the International Ethics Standards Board for Accountants, ISBA for short, and I will be the moderator of this webinar. I'm really pleased to see that uh, so many professionals have joined us uh, today. Uh, the, the webinar panel shows more than 400 attendees, which is great. Uh, but let me start the event by introducing our presenters, uh, Mr. Ian McPhee and Ms. Caroline Lee. They are both members of the ISBA Space Task Force and participated in developing the revisions to the ISBA Code of Ethics that they are going to present us today. Ian is an ISBA member and the chair of the FEAS Task Force. He has been a public member of the ISBA since 2016 and formerly a member of the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board. Previously, Ian was Auditor General for Australia between 2005 and 2015. Caroline became a member of the ISBA in 2017, and since the beginning of this year, she has been the deputy chair of the board as well. Caroline has over 30 years of experience in the public accountancy profession that she spent all with KPMG. She is a partner at KPMG in Singapore and Asia Pacific head of quality and risk management. So welcome Ian and Caroline. Thank you for joining us today. And Thanks, Sylvia. Thanks, before, Sylvia. Yeah, before uh, we start the presentation, I would like to let you know that if you have any questions at any time during the session, you can submit them by using the question box in your go-to uh, webinar control panel that you can find just above the chat function. Ian and Caroline will answer as many questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. And please also note that the, the webinar event is being recorded and will be posted on the ISBOS website. This means that you will be able to access it later and perhaps share it with your network. But without further ado, let me turn to Ian now, who will be our first presenter today. Uh, thanks, Sylvia, and thanks everyone for being online uh, for, the, for the webinar today. It's, it's great to have you on board and Great to be able to talk about the recent uh, revisions to the code to strengthen the uh, requirements around fee, fees. Uh, so, uh, as Sylvia has flagged, um, uh, working with Caroline Lee tonight, Caroline's from Singapore and Deputy Chair of the IESPA, and it's great to have her and her practice experience not only tonight, but all, all the way through the project. It's been very good to have her experience on board. This fees project and the related non-assurance services project have been two very important responses by the profession at a global level to strengthen the code and uh, and it's been uh, great to work on this with the colleagues on the, on, on the board uh, so what i'd like to do is to step through uh, the slides uh, caroline and i are sharing the presentation tonight i'll do the first half and uh, and uh, Caroline will take over. And then as Sylvia mentioned, uh, we can handle uh, questions subsequently after the presentation has been completed. So let me start uh, with the first slide. Thanks, Stu, just, uh, just covering the agenda. So um, what I'd like to uh, cover tonight with Caroline is firstly the background to this particular project of the board, this, the, then cover the key areas uh, with the most significant changes uh, to the code. So these cover the threats created by fees paid by an audit client, uh, requirements around the level of audit fees, the proportion of fees, fee dependency, enhanced transparency, and then just touch on a range of uh, conforming and consequential amendments. Then to let you know, the resources that we are currently working on to assist the implementation of these new requirements and support material and also other new developments in train there's a serious effort going on by the board to uh, to assist the implementation given the importance of these projects so uh, you'll hear a little bit more a little bit more about that at the end of tonight's session caroline will touch on that 
but over time, uh, and certainly by the end of the year, you'll hear a lot more. And then, as Sylvia mentioned, the final part will be the Q&A session. So, uh, uh, as you, next slide, thank you. So the background uh, to the um, to the fees project is uh, is to build on the the current code, which already provides a strong foundation, particularly with its focus on the fundamental principles and the conceptual framework. That is the heart of the code, and uh, and 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 so these requirements draw on, build on the conceptual framework and uh, in, include some new requirements but i have to say the board has been measured in articulating requirements and in some cases where initially we considered requirements we've been able to build on the code and just include application material but uh, the bottom line was the feedback we were receiving was that more work was required to strengthen the international independence standards especially for uh, PIE audit clients. And so that's what the board has, uh, has set out to do. And, uh, and in doing that, we've sought to be responsive to a range of feedback we receive, um, particularly from regulatory stakeholders, uh, public interest oversight board, but also a range of other commentators uh, voicing public interest considerations. So the board agreed in the early days to to do some research, do some analysis, and so we kicked off with a uh, fact-finding exercise, as we called it, um, and uh, and that was informed by a range of uh, uh, different tasks, if you like, that the the working group at that time considered. Firstly, we had a a review of the relevant provisions in G20 jurisdictions dealing with fees and transparency and other matters relating to fees. The, uh, we then had an, an, an academic, uh, Professor Hay from New Zealand, have a look at the academic and other literature to help us get an understanding of the issues from that perspective. And finally, uh, the third stage of our fact-finding exercise was a questionnaire that we, uh, as a board, circulated to a range of stakeholders uh, and uh, to get feedback from their perspective. So we did the research and the message was, yes, there was certainly benefit in, in, the, in the board agreeing to a task force and considering the opportunities for strengthening the code in relation to fees. So thank you, Sue. Next slide, thank you. So just by, by way of background, um, um, the exposure draft, uh, was published by the board for comments in January 2020. Um, it seems like a while ago, but it's not that long ago. We we were pleased with the responses, uh, it's very considered responses, and I do have to say the due process is such an important step in the development of the code and revisions to it, and we received 64 comments from a good range of stakeholders, including monitoring group members. Um, and finally, the board did approve the final announcement in December 2020 at the same time as the non-assurance services project. So the board set itself a pretty tough target to, to meet and landed both the fees and the NAS projects together. And, um, and, uh, and the formal uh, changes were released after the Public Interest Oversight Board approved the new, cha new changes in April of this year. So that's the background. Next slide, thanks. So um, as many on the webinar will be aware, we have taken slightly different approaches for uh, PIE or clients and non-PIE or clients in terms of the requirements. Um, uh, mainly due to the heightened stakeholder expectations for PIE audit clients. There's no question about that. And, uh, and also we took into account feedback from the smaller end of the market and concerns about undue burden. Uh, and, uh, and so we've tried to reach a balanced position. 
and uh, and in many cases, of course, judgments required on some of the decisions, and the board has sought to be measured in weighing public interest considered considerations, but also, of course, uh, administrative burden and other considerations. So, um, uh, the other thing that we understood we would need to do was to have a look at the revision to the PIE definition itself. And as many on the call will know, there's an exercise currently being progressed by the board to consider uh, revisions to the PIE definition. And we, uh, again, set ourselves a pretty reasonable target by seeing if we can finalise that project by the end of this particular calendar year. Um, uh, but irrespective of where the board lands on the PIE project, uh, the, fo the focus for the fees project has been on establishing the principles and requirements that should apply to PIE audits, uh, however they are defined, wherever the board lands, in December, so uh, the the current requirements in relation to fees will still be applicable and still uh, still uh, work going forward. So thanks for the next slide. Thank you. So uh, there's quite a number of sections of the code that have been impacted by the changes. Um, Certainly the most significant ones are to section 410 in part 4A of the independence, international independence standards. Um, there's um, other, uh, quite a, a range of uh, conforming and consequential amendments as you'd expect. Um, just to buttress the uh, proposals we've put forward in the independence standards and to recognise some developments with our uh, sister board in the IAASB uh, and the work they've been doing around uh, ISQM1 and ISA220 and ISQM2. So we've tried to work pretty closely. In fact, we have worked closely with the IAASB. It's been a good relationship and we've valued that uh, very much. Um, the other thing that um, we, we have done, as you would expect in the code, it builds on the revised and restructured code and preserves the building block approach that's inherent in the code. So we, we continue to have the applicable conceptual framework in place, which requires professional accountants to identify threats to compliance with the fundamental principles, evaluate the threats identified and address the threats by eliminating them or reducing them to an acceptable level. So that's, as everyone knows on the call, that's inherent in the code and continues, of course, through the international independence standards. Next slide, thanks. Yeah, thank you. So the, just looking at, some of the changes we've broken them down into five categories as displayed on this uh, this slide the first one deals with changes to address threats created by fees paid by the order client particularly uh, in this case the self-interest threat and possibly an intimidation threat uh, and in that area there are new, no new requirements uh, we initially did have in mind a requirement but but was based on feedback, able to just develop and build on the conceptual framework to highlight the issues uh, about the importance of addressing threats created by fees paid by the audit client. The second area uh, is uh, uh, some new provisions around the level of the audit fees. Essentially, uh, in the broad, this is about keeping the audit fee whole to inform stakeholders of the fees and uh, and to allow them to make judgments about the firm's independence and the level of resources allocated to the to the audit. The third area um, deals with changes to address issues about the proportion of fees paid for services other than audit to audit fees. Um, no additional requirements in the code here, but certainly. Um, uh, a range of additional application material and I'll explain a little more about those 
uh, as we get into the detail. The fourth area is uh, enhanced uh, provisions in relation to fee dependency for all audit clients, uh, both uh, PIE audit clients in particular, but also non-PIEs. Uh, and finally, and perhaps one of the more uh, uh, controversial, if you like, areas we, we had to deal with was the uh, promoting greater transparency of free related information for PIE audit clients to both those charged with governance and to stakeholders more broadly through uh, through public disclosure. Um, so what I'd like to do now is to step through each of these five areas in a little more detail, but as an overall comment, it's worth saying to you that the board has endeavoured uh, to take a balanced position, bearing in mind the public interest and taking into account the broad range of comments received as the project pro progressed. So we, we did modify views based on the feedback we received from, from uh, uh, the exposure draft comments, comments. And I think we've got a pretty reasonable balance in all the circumstances. So let's now uh, move to consider the first box there, but consider it in a little more detail on the next slide. So this is the, um, the area of threats created by fees paid by the audit client. Um, I've got a couple of slides on this, but the first one here um, uh, did um, uh, come about because of concerns about the connection between the level of audit fees and ethics and independence matters and how these might affect audit quality. It showed up in the research we undertook and some of the feedback we received. So. Uh, there was a concern that the uh, level of the fees could affect audit quality. Um, now, um, the first thing and important thing to say is we have not attempted to regulate the level of fees in the global code. Uh, there's not much uh, chance of us being able to do that. We had no intention of doing that. Um, we quickly concluded that this, the level of the fees is a firm's business decision taking into account all of the facts and circumstances relevant to the engagement with special regard to the requirements of professional and technical standards. But what we have done is to strengthen the guardrails around auditor independence concerning the threats created in circumstances related to fees paid by the actual audit client. Um, so what the board uh, did agree was the importance of raising the awareness of the inherent self-interest threat related to the audit payer model when fees are negotiated and paid by the audit client. We did feel that there was actually a threat there and we needed to uh, uh, deal with that in the code. So our view was that a self-interest threat exists and this is based on the risk inherent whenever the party subject to an examination directly pays the examiner. We're not attempting to change the, the, uh, the client payer business model. Uh, as I've said elsewhere, it's been around for two or 300 years, so uh, no, no attempt to change that or suggesting it's flawed from an independence perspective, only requiring that the uh, firm should evaluate whether the threats are at an acceptable level. And uh, the other thing we do acknowledge is firms might often conclude that the level of the self-interest threat is at an acceptable level because of the various uh, policies, requirements, etc., that the firm uh, responds to. Next slide, thanks. So, um, Based on the application of the conceptual framework, firms are required to determine whether threats created by fees proposed to the audit client, either by the firm or network firms, are at an acceptable level. As you know, that's the conceptual framework, that's the expectation, and that's required before accepting an audit engagement and if there is a change during the period of the audit engagement. We have included new guidance to help firms evaluate whether threats created by 
fees charged are at an acceptable level and a lot of the material in, included in the code and the revisions are about additional guidance to help uh, firms evaluate whether the threats are at an acceptable level. We've also included, uh, I think, some helpful conforming amendments to section 120, which references the existence of a quality management system designed and implemented by a firm in accordance with the quality management standards issued by the IAASB is an important element in the evaluation. Um, but we do uh, make the point that certain circumstances could impact the evaluation of the level of the self-interest threat. For instance, uh, whether there is a high ratio of non-audit fees, overdue fees or fee dependency. And as you will appreciate, these considerations could, could elevate the, uh, the threat. And we, we make that fairly clear and include guidance to those facts and circumstances. And also, not only the facts and circumstances that might elevate the threat, but also examples of actions that might be safeguards to address self-interest or intimidation threats are also given. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's obviously pretty important as well. So these changes are very much about highlighting the threats created by fees paid by the audit client, which need to be considered when fees for professional services are negotiated with and paid by the client. And the board, as I touched on earlier, agreed that a specific requirement was not necessary. Rather, the board agreed to the inclusion of application material that reinforces the general requirements in the conceptual framework to achieve the same effects. So I think that was a that was a good outcome. Thank you. The next slide. Thank you. So the second distinct area that I mentioned on the earlier uh, slide with the four categories was the um, the level of audit fees, and uh, and the level of fees is considered only a factor. Uh, and as I said before, the board in its wisdom decided it couldn't regulate fees it didn't want to and so the level of audit fees is only a factor that could impact the evaluation of the level of threats created by fees paid by an audit client however the changes do emphasize the importance of the audit fee as a standalone fee uh, it was felt important that uh, that be clear to allow stakeholders those charged with governance and uh, stakeholders outside of the firm and the uh, audit client to be able to make decisions about the uh, independence of the auditor and, uh, and the importance of a standalone fee, fee was seen as central to that. So there is a requirement uh, on keeping the fee whole um, uh, and prohibiting firms from allowing the provision of services other than audit to influence the level of the audit fee. So that's a clear requirement. Uh, after further consideration and feedback, uh, the board did allow an exception for real cost savings achieved uh, to the audit fee as a result of experience derived from the provisions of services other than audit. But there was, a, there was no intention to open a back door here for firms, uh, for firms and the intention was only to allow demonstrable cost savings to the audit fee to be entertained. Uh, in the audit fee going forward. Um, there were some concerns from respondents to the ED regarding how firms could demonstrate and document compliance with this requirement. Um, from the board's perspective, uh, we believe the prohibition sets out a clear principle that's aimed at guiding behaviour. And rather than uh, include additional docu documentation requirements, the board actually felt that the principle will influence firms' policies and procedures on determining audit fees. Uh, for instance, going forward, we expect firms could document their approach to compliance with this requirement through their policies, including policies with respect to documentation. And just to reiterate a point I touched on earlier, through the course of this project, the board was conscious of not adding unnecessary requirements or additional administrative burden on firms, rather being open to seeing the development of practice 
and being willing to review any further issues over time consistent with the general practice the board has adopted. So that's where we've landed on audit fees, a requirement for keeping the fee whole and, and subsequently we'll talk about disclosure, but, uh, but uh, that's essentially the changes in that area. The third distinct area, the next slide, thanks, Stu. The, the next uh, area, the third area on that earlier slide that I mentioned was just dealing with the proportion of fees paid for services other than audit. Um, and, uh, and so, um, as you will be aware, there's a range of uh, approaches being taken that have been taken internationally. Um, and the underlying concern, of course, driving this was that a, a firm or network firm could focus more on the non-audit relationship, which might create a threat to the auditor's independence. So that's the fundamental issue that we were trying to deal with. Um, where we landed was no threshold or ratio has been suggested as a cap or as a trigger to evaluate uh, threats because we took into account, firstly, the feedback we received, uh, at, particularly at the global workshops. There was, I think, four global workshops uh, undertaken uh, in, re in relation to the NAS project and pretty strong feedback that, uh, that uh, a threshold or a cap was not required there. This, the related issue was that the, ch the subsequent changes arising from the NAS project are expected to reduce significantly the, the provision of NAS services to audit clients. So that's another consideration. And, uh, and the, I guess the other related point is in a global code, trying to establish a reasonable percentage was, would, would have been quite difficult. And the final factor that was probably the matter that persuaded the board most was the new and proposed requirements on enhanced transparency, uh, which we'll touch on later, was also an important uh, consideration. Uh, if there is transparency related to NAS, then that's pretty significant as well as transparency in relation to the audit fees. So that, um, that all said, we still acknowledge that a large proportion of fees for services other than audit to audit fees might create threats to independence. And there is guidance now included to help firms determine what would con constitute a large proportion in specific circumstances. And that determination should be made at the network and group level. Uh, and, uh, and so we've got a degree of, uh, quite a degree of uh, material in there to assist uh, firms to make those decisions. Um, there were uh, concerns also that, um, fees for services provided by network firms or for services for related entities, especially sister entities, would create different levels of threats. Uh, and again, the board accepted that and acknowledged these factors in the evaluation of threats. So there's quite a number of new factors mentioned to take into account in considering the threats in the code in this area. So to the extent practical, we've certainly taken into account the feedback we received, the insights and even the examples provided to us by commentators and uh, all of this I think has added uh, uh, application material to make the code clearer and to strengthen it at the same time. So that's the position we've taken on the proportion of fees. The next section is fee dependency on PIE audit clients. Uh, as to, I'll ask you just to pass to the next slide and I'll invite Caroline Lee, my colleague Caroline, to, uh, to uh, take over the presentation at this stage and take us through to the questions and answers. So thank you, Caroline. Thanks, Ian. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So um, Ian has given you a background of the FEAST project and he's covered the key areas such as threats created by fees paid uh, by an audit client, the level of audit fees and the proportion of fees. Uh, 
so at this point in time, I will then continue uh, to touch on fee dependency, enhance transparency, and conforming and consequential amendments. So in the extent code, um, it included a, a fee threshold for PIE audit uh, clients at uh, the firm level. And that threshold was 15% for two consecutive years. So if the total received, total fees received from an audit client, either for audit or other services exceeds 15% of the total fees generated by the firm, the extent code requires the firm to determine whether a pre-issuance or a post-issuance review uh, from an external party could be an appropriate action to reduce the threat to an acceptable level. And this external party could be another uh, professional accountant or a professional body. If the firm determines that none of these actions could reduce the threat, then the firm has to end that audit engagement. So there's no change to the threshold and to the concept in the uh, revision. However, the ISPA strongly uh, supports that only a pre-issuance review performed by a professional accountant outside the firm could be capable of reducing the threats to an acceptable level. Uh, we received many questions from commentators uh, regarding this type of review. The extent code and the exposure draft uh, had set out that the pre-issuance review uh, ought to be an engagement quality review. But due to the timing of the determination of fee dependency, firms may not be able to comply with all the requirements set out in IWSB's standards that's relevant to an engagement quality review. So as a result, uh, we say that this review should be consistent with the objective of an engagement quality review. As to next slide, please. Continuing on on fee dependency, the IAS was of the view that fee dependency on a PI audit client cannot continue indefinitely. So there's no safeguard that's capable of reducing the threat to an acceptable level if, uh, if this de dependency continues uh, in perpetuity. And as a result, there's a requirement for firms to cease being the auditor if the fee dependency continues for five consecutive years. So we received comments that this may result in a mandatory firm rotation. Uh, our response is that it's not equal to a mandatory firm rotation as the firm provides other services other than audit and it can end those engagements in order to reduce the fee dependency. There were other concerns raised that in some circumstances, ending the audit engagement will not be in the public interest. For example, there's no other auditor available with the same skills and experience required to, uh, to perform an effective audit. So being mindful of possible market-specific issues, uh, there is an exception that will apply in special circumstances. And that would be if there's compelling reason for the firm to continue as the auditor and a regulator or professional body concurs that this continuance would be in the public interest. As to next slide, please. So what I just discussed was fee dependency on PI audit clients. And next, we'll touch on fee dependency for non-PI audit clients. So in the case of non-PI audit clients, the IS also considered whether there would be a benefit 
in enhancing the provisions in respect of uh, non-PI audit clients with the aim of promoting consistent application. If we adopt the PI model to uh, the non-PI audit clients in the X10 code, taking into account market specificities and uh, the IESPA project of uh, revisiting the definition of PIs, uh, we then concluded that the inclusion of a threshold um, to create a consistent approach would be if we had a 30% limit in conjunction with five consecutive years and allowing uh, pre-issuance or post-issuance review by an external party. So that external party being an external professional accountant or a professional body. Uh, and such action would reduce the threat to an acceptable level. So there were concerns raised regarding the level of that threshold. Uh, some commentators suggested that 30% is too high as it gives the impression that you know, up to this threshold, threats are at, at an acceptable level. Uh, there are other provisions in the code for all audit clients that require the evaluation of the threats created by fee dependency from the first year. So that should address um, that concern. There were also questions raised regarding the basis and the rationale for this threshold. There were concerns that a review by an external party may be too burdensome for uh, SMEs and SMPs. On balance, um, it was viewed that as we do not have an ex exit clause, and uh, you know, it would be good to have that fee dependency and also, there isn't a requirement for enhanced transparency in the case of non-PI audit clients. So we think that 30% for five consecutive years uh, would be, would be uh, appropriate. And uh, together with a post or pre-issuance review by an external party. Next slide. The next topic is enhanced transparency of fee-related information. And this is applicable for PIE audit clients only. When an audit client is a public interest entity, stakeholders have heightened expectations regarding the firm's independence. And as a result, enhanced transparency will help inform stakeholders' judgments about the firm's independence. There's uh, no intention to require disclosure of comparable information. The disclosure of information to those charged with governance and to the public is in relation to fees paid by the audit client for audit and other services to the firm and network firms, and also information related to fee dependency. The flexible approach for firms to achieve such transparency uh, is there. So it's really for the firms to decide how best to achieve that transparency. Uh, disclosure of information that is essential from the perspective of the firm's independence ought to be uh, set out. We did hear concerns that this requirement might create an administrative burden. But, um, you know, it is important to, uh, to have that transparency in order to achieve a greater um, 
meeting of the needs of stakeholders. On the next slide, so in terms of enhanced transparency of fee-related information, uh, there are um, certain exceptions. And so the scope of related entities that should be covered in the disclosure um, is limited to only downstream related entities over which the client has direct or indirect control. So there isn't a requirement to disclose the amount of fees for services other than audit provided to all related entities. It's only those related entities that are downstream uh, entities that are controlled directly or indirectly. So the ISPA was mindful of the practicalities of disclosing uh, information concerning such fees. And that was the reason for making this uh, exception for the related entities. There were commentators who observed that the proposals could create a significant and undue compliance burden for firms especially in the case of private equity complexes or similar investment company complexes. And they pointed out that where a private equity firm is an investment holding company, the portfolio companies are generally not consolidated into the financial statements of the private equity firm. And it was also noted that funds and portfolio companies would generally be subject to corporate governance from a different group of individuals other than those charged with governance of the private equity firm. Also, in some major jurisdictions, uh, such as US and the European Union, uh, law, the laws or regulations do not require private equity firms to disclose information about fees paid by their controlled portfolio companies that are not required to be included in the consolidated financial statements. Therefore, ISPA uh, has determined that the fees paid to such controlled entities um, that are not included in the consolidation should only be included when the fees uh, are known or when the firm knows or has reason to believe that such fee disclosure are relevant to the evaluation of the firm's independence. So this is the knows or has reason to believe test. So the ISPA believes that this is a balanced approach. Lastly, to avoid duplication of efforts in relation to compiling and communicating the information, the IFSPA has determined uh, to provide an exception to the public disclosure requirement in the case of standalone financial statements of a PIE parent entity and wholly owned subsidiaries included in group financial statements which are published by the PIE parent entity. So if the parent entity is required to prepare financial statements at the group and single entity level, then if there are wholly owned subsidiaries in the group, uh, there isn't a need for disclosure. But the ISPA believes that this exception should not be extended to controlled entities, PIE controlled entities that are not wholly owned, given the presence and the interests of minority shareholders. If we go on to the next slide. So in terms of enhanced communication with those charged with governance, we have set out proposals that are in line with requirements of ISA 260 revised. 
And we believe that the communication with those charged with governance provides a basis for a meaningful two-way discussion with those charged with governance in assessing the firm's independence. The requirement to disclose to those charged with governance uh, includes not just the figures regarding fees, but also the firm's judgment on threats created. So there are guidance on other fee-related information that firms might consider for communication. On the next slide, please, Estu. Some respondents to the exposure draft had, had raised that public disclosure of fee-related information should be required by regulators or um, the auditing standards. And it should be the responsibility of the client and not the firm. The ISPA aims to provide global transparency in the code. And therefore, it acknowledges that fee disclosure would be best presented by the audit client. But if that disclosure is not made by the client, the firm should communicate with those charged with governance about the benefit of disclosure to stakeholders. And if the client still does not agree to make that disclosure, then the firm has to do so. So the flexible approach for firms uh, to achieve this transparency is important. And it's also important that the disclosure should be timely and should be in an accessible manner. On the next slide, we have some examples of examples in the code on uh, various suitable ways for disclosure by the firm. So for example, the disclosure can make, be made in the audit report, or it can be made on the firm's website, in the firm's transparency report, in the audit quality report, or in a targeted communication to specific stakeholders. So these examples are in line with the IWSB's approach regarding communication with external parties about the firm's system of quality management set up in ISQM1. The ISPA staff will publish supporting material such as an FAQ regarding the details to the fee disclosure such as the proposed location for such disclosure within the audit report. The ISPA considered that there's potential for inconsistent ways of communication given the, the various alternatives. Nevertheless, the primary intention is to achieve disclosure by the client. In, in case that information is not disclosed by the client, then it is necessary to allow the practice to evolve and for the market to eventually settle on what would be the best practice. Next slide, please, Estu. In terms of the consequential amendments, uh, changes proposed to Part 4A have implications for assurance engagements other than audit and review engagements as set out in Part 4B. So there's a need to consider the nature of the assurance engagements, whether it's limited in scope, it's for a narrow purpose, uh, and whether it's non-recurring in nature. It's also important to consider the parties involved in an assurance engagement. Still, there is an inherent self-interest threat when fees for an assurance engagement are negotiated with and paid by the audit client. It should be noted that there are no special provisions for PIEs 
On the next slide. So the IASPA is committed to supporting the adoption and application of the revised NAS and fees related mm. provision. Uh, resources that are currently available would be the basis for conclusion, uh, infographics, YouTube videos that ISPA board members have recorded. And coming soon, we've got fact sheets, FAQs and articles. And last but not least, uh, today's and tomorrow's webinars. These resources are available at ethicsbot.org slash strengthening IIS. So with that, I've come to uh, the end of Ian's and my presentation on revisions to fee-related provisions of the code. And I'll hand it back to Sylvia to moderate the Q&A session. Sylvia? Thank you very much, Ian and Caroline. It was a really informative presentation and I think it was a great overview of the revisions. And now I think we have a couple of more minutes to, to respond to some of the questions participants submitted for us. And the first question I would turn to you, Ian, is, is regarding this, the self-interest threat. So the question is that does the revision regarding the inherent self-interest threat mean that the auditor's independence is impaired unless a third party, for example, a regulator, sets out the fees for the audit? Ah, thanks, Sylvia. Uh, I, I think what is important here is the revisions really are focused on raising awareness of the threats that the firm is already required to address and evaluate based on the application of the conceptual framework. So this is not a new requirement. It's been inherent in the conceptual framework, but because of the feedback we received, we are looking to support and strengthen the code through uh, additional requirements, but also importantly, application material to assist users of the code. Uh, the second thing that I'd like to say is, um, certainly there's no new requirement here, um, the firm should evaluate whether the threats created are at an acceptable level, and if not, uh, the firm must take action consistent with the application of the conceptual framework. The other thing that we have said is that the firms will often conclude that the level of threats created by fees paid by an audit client uh, is at an acceptable level. Uh, and while we haven't been uh, explicit in, in saying this within the code, Clearly, one of the considerations we're looking to address is circumstances when fees are either too low or too high and the threats that potentially that might create. So in short, um, we're not seeking to say the audit payer model is flawed uh, from the perspective of auditor independence and we're not suggesting any change to the current audit payer model, which is recognised and well accepted by uh, everyone uh, uh, and the intended users also of financial statements. It's about raising awareness. Thanks, Sylvia. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, I think the next question, next question is for Caroline regarding the uh, public disclosure. Wouldn't it raise any confidentiality issues if the firm discloses the client's fee-related information without the actual consent from the client. Caroline, it is over to you. Yes, uh, Sylvia. So the question is whether it would raise confidentiality issues if the firm discloses the uh, the fee-related information without the actual consent from the client. So yes. the code the code sets out that confidentiality serves the public interest because it facilitates the free flow of information between uh, the client or the employing organization to the professional accountant in the knowledge that the information will not be disclosed to a third party. 
nevertheless, the, the code acknowledges circumstances where professional accountants are or might be required to disclose confidential information or where such disclosure might be appropriate. So this is, includes disclosure of information to comply with professional standards, including uh, relevant ethical requirements. So in the event that the firm has concerns that the disagreement might give rise to uh, an intimidation threat to independence that is not at an acceptable level, the code requires the firm to address that intimidation threat by eliminating, eliminating the circumstances, uh, by applying safeguards or declining or um, ending the specific professional activity. So to summarize, if the client doesn't consent to that disclosure, then the professional accountant or the firm has to consider whether that gives rise to an intimidation threat to independence that is not at an acceptable level. And if that threat, that intimidation threat is not at an acceptable level, then the firm has to address that intimidation threat by eliminating the circumstance by applying safeguards or declining or ending that uh, audit relationship. Thank you, Sylvia. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one more question to Ian. And the question is that how could the firm obtain information about fees paid for services provided by network firms or fees paid by the related party of the audit client? As it is stated that sometimes the amount of such fees is not available for the auditor, especially in the case of sister entities. Ian? Uh, thanks, Sylvia. I can be brief. Um, basically, the board did consider this, but uh, certainly with the implementation of the new ISQM1 in particular, but with the availability of quality management systems uh, generally in, in any event, fees proposed within a firm's network for services to an audit client or its related entities should be available uh, without major difficulty or significant burden. Um, nevertheless, um, the, the, the board did agree that the level of threats created by fees uh, paid to network firms is usually lower than the threats created by similar fees paid to the firm. Uh, so in line with the overall uh, principle, overarching principles of the in international independence standards, fees for services provided to a sister entity could still create a self-interest threat and might create a, uh, an intimidation threat. So we uh, agreed that firms should include such fees when evaluating the level of threats created by fees paid by the audit client. But we, as I said earlier, we did acknowledge that the level of threats created by fees paid for services provided to a controlled entity could differ from the level of threats in relation to a sister entity. So I think we've got the balance pretty well right there. Thanks, Sylvia. Sylvia, Thank can you. I... Uh, take one question, one further question that I sure. see. So the yes, question no is, problem. if the audit fee should be a disclosure made by the client, should this not be taken up with accounting uh, bodies that prepare the financial reporting standards, such as the IASB that's responsible for IFRS standards? Uh, so the... Uh, Task Force did consider, um, you know, whether that disclosure should be made as part of the financial reporting, uh, but it was felt that, uh, you know, there, there are instances where disclosure on fees isn't in the financial reporting standards, but it could be in laws and regulations. Um, so as a or listing requirements, as a result, uh, we then went and discussed and sought inputs from the IWSB because uh, this, this fee-related information is really about the fee that the auditor receives 
from providing services to, to its audit client. Um, and as a result, uh, in our discussions with the, the IWSB, it, uh, it was the conclusion that we can make that disclosure in the audit report. Uh, but the preference is really that the disclosure be made by the client. And that's why the, the recommendation is that there should be discussion with those charged with governance in order to uh, communicate to them the benefit of making this disclosure to their stakeholders. And if the client still does not agree to make that disclosure, then in that instance, um, the, the firm would have the option of making that disclosure, uh, be it in the audit report or uh, various other alternatives such as the firm's website, the transparency report, the audit quality report, or even have a targeted communication to specific stakeholders. So I hope that helps to answer that question. Sylvia, back to you. Thank you very much, Caroline. And I believe that we have uh, come to the end of our session today. Uh, thank you, Ian and Caroline, for your excellent presentation. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, as a reminder, the recording and the slides of this webinar will be available shortly. Uh, if you wish to access this or any other useful materials uh, supporting the implementation of the revisions, please visit the ISBUS website at the ethicsboard.org uh, uh, under the focus areas uh, uh, folder. And I would like to take this opportunity also to remind you that tomorrow at the same time, ISBA will hold another global webinar where you can learn more about the revised non-assurance services provisions of the code. And I think it's still not too late to register. Uh, thank you very much. Have a wonderful rest of the day and goodbye.